Thanks for joining me today as we talk about the Dragon Accord, also called the Celestial Boundary, and some of the characters who have a big part to play in its creation or understanding. The Dragon Accord is some sort of agreement undertaken, or forced upon, all of the celestial beings on Terminus, whether they be native or immigrant. As far as we know, it was created shortly after the Great Dragon War that led Rocknell Thamos to become the ruler of both the rival Reen, the Dragons of the Sky, and the Soul Crow Main, the Dragons of the Sea. It is written in the language of the Dragon King, called Drac Elrin. This language is even more obscure and mysterious than Drac Fane, the tongue of the Rainborn. Though we can't prove precisely who drew this agreement, we can make a fairly strong inference based on the lore evidence we've been given so far, though please don't take this as absolute fact. The assumption is that the Dragon Accord was created jointly by the native divines of Terminus and the ancient dragons. This is likely true for several reasons. Firstly, the Dragon Accord is written in Drac Elrin, the language of the Dragon King and him alone. This means that Rocknil Thamos presumably helped in the creation of the Accord. Though, were it only his doing, he likely would have had no qualms breaking the Accord at the climax of the Deicide War. However, this was not the case, and we may assume that other extraordinarily powerful creatures, the Divine's native Terminus, had a hand in the document's creation. It is possible, though rather unlikely, that a previous Dragon King wrote the document. Secondarily, the vast majority of the ancient dragons left the realm to honor the Accord. Surely, were it not an agreement between the native divines and the dragons, the dragons would have balked at their dismissal. So, it was written by a mythic dragon and some unknown beings of presumably immense power, but what exactly is it for? The celestial boundary is self-defining. It's literally a boundary between the celestial realm of Terminus and the mortal realm. It prevents the deities from other planets from interacting with their people upon Terminus. There is a way around this limitation, however. A deity may choose to sacrifice their immortality, and presumably some amount of their power, to descend beyond the celestial boundary. This results in a form called High Mortal. Through the trial and error of deities come to Terminus, we may discern a fair bit more detail about dissension than just this. The first deity that we know of to have descended was Razak the Rageful, of the Dwarven Pantheon. Lockenhammer, the Dwarven Balance, forcibly descended him after he tried to devour the Dwarven race. From this, we know that a deity can be descended by another deity, but any further details are a mystery. Peripherally, we may also learn from this that the mandates that bound gods upon their planets to certain behaviors are not present upon Terminus though whether this is due to the celestial boundary or not is uncertain. Razak's counterpart, Kazis, and Lockenhammer descended of their own volition, and did so quietly and without miracle. During the second era of collision, shortly after the arrival of the Jinto on Terminus, Ganavi descended her husband, Itero, to try and relieve him of a malady that plagued him. Unfortunately, for he would soon after become the Ravaging Lord, this was unsuccessful. This perhaps implies that the core entity that is a divine remains the same despite dissension. Ganavi descended shortly after Itero, and her dissension brought with it a miracle. She blessed the Jinto people, preventing them from becoming corrupted with Itero's madness. Now in truth, we don't know if the dissension created the miracle. It is equally possible that Ganavi could only work her sacrificial miracle once descended beyond the celestial boundary. A few years after this, two different Dark Mirror deities descended, Nythir and then Cyrani. Firstly, Nythir sacrificed his body to create habitable water for the Myrrh, and though it's not explicitly stated, at this point we can very strongly infer that he must have descended first. Cyrani exhausted herself to alter the form of the Myrrh, though this wasn't what killed her. With both Nythir and Cyrani, again, we aren't sure whether the dissension fueled the miracle or if it was simply that they were unable to work miracles from beyond the boundary. Hathis Kavgrejel of the Archai and Osiri of the Humans both descended to betray their people and support the Ravaging Lord in the Deicide War. These last few examples don't really give us anything new, but simply strengthen our ideas about how dissension works. Now finally, we come to the War Wizards. These six are perhaps the most interesting of our high mortals, and definitely the most mysterious. 
We know that there was one war wizard from each current pantheon. Dwarves, elves, ogres, mer, archai, and human. But we don't know exactly how they were created. Were the war wizards descended gods, or were they chosen mortals that were imbued with great power? If the latter, this could be a loophole in the accord that allows gods to interact with the mortal world without descending themselves. When the war wizards left, the dragon accord was strengthened. We don't know why or who did this, but since that time, the end of the Deicide War, we have not seen any further dissensions or miracles. On that note, it may be of use to note the interactions between Dry Kofiros, Rocknil Thamos, and the Emissary, possibly the Emissary of the Old Gods who forged the Dragon Accord with Rocknil Thamos. When the Ravaging Lord threatened the Pillar Ka upon rainfall, Rai Kofiros was spurred to defend her territory. Unfortunately, we don't know if the Ravaging Lord's actions broke the Dragon Accord and thereby permitted Rai Kofiros to act, or if she was not bound by the Accord to begin with and was only awoken or angered by the Ravaging Lord. Once Rai Kofiros showed herself and was slain by the Ravaging Lord, Rock Nilthamos appeared and slew the instigator of the Deicide War. In this case, we may surmise that the King of Dragons was indeed bound by the Accord because of the Emissary's words to him following, Blood for blood, King, there is no breach. These words could mean that Rock Nilthamos was allowed to spill blood because Rai Kofiros' blood was spilled. The current assumption is that this creature was the emissary of the old gods, or was an old god himself, or itself. Ostensibly, he was charged with the overseeing of the celestial boundary. We didn't see a display of force, but the fact that Rock Nilthamos was quieted by mere words could imply that this creature had the ability to punish the Dragon King if he breached their contract. Is the Accord intended to protect the Rainborn? As we saw, Rock Nilthamos only appeared when Rai Kafiros was slain. This allowed the Dragon King to avenge his fallen sister, but that was it. He was not allowed to act further, and retellings from the Deicide War would lead one to believe that he fully intended to, were it not for the Emissary. Are all the dragons bound by the Dragon Accord? This question we can make some headway with, thanks to the adventures of Narian Castigu and Caelan Greyborn. These two were the ones who discovered that the document is written in the ancient dragon tongue, Drac Eldrin. They also uncovered that inscriptions of this language cannot be damaged by any normal means, evidence of the magic of that ancient tongue. During their correspondence, Narian was escorted by Kazas himself, high mortal king of the dwarves, to speak with the dragon so that they may uncover more about the accord. The question of what Kazas has to gain from this might be asked, but there would be no answer. Kazas and Narian did meet with Tel Naharsis, the snow dragon. Though this did not yield the results Narian was looking for, it did give us a few small clues. This reveals that not all dragons are bound by the Dragon Accord, as Tel Naharsis was certainly not inhibited from interacting with Narian and Kazis. We're given the names of what we may assume are past dragon kings, and the hint that the Dragon Accord holds insight into the transcendence of dragon kind. However, the whole story probably breeds more questions than answers. What was it that Tel Naharsis could have gained by seeing the documents? How did he learn Drac Elrin despite not being a king of dragons? What agreement did he have with Kazis, mentioned in their encounter? What information within the Accord had to do with the transcendence of dragons? Another question we don't have a straight answer to is precisely why the Dragon Accord was written, or who it truly benefits, and I suspect that these revelations will be a tale long in the making. Rock Nilthamos, one of the presumed authors of the Accord, was a rather devious creature of nearly immeasurable strength. After defeating the Sulk Romain, he slew his own father and usurped his throne so that he could be king of all dragons. Undoubtedly, he and his people had something to gain in the co-writing of the Accord, but that begs a question of what, and unfortunately, we just don't know. One rather striking line that we're given is that, quote, even the king of all dragon kind must know the paranoia of a tyrant." End quote. While perhaps an innocuous literary string, it could also be a hint as to Rock Nilthamos' obedience of this accord. Could the Dragon King have brokered the Dragon Accord to protect himself from the threat of new gods? If that's the case, then someone must have had knowledge that new gods, new people were coming. Would that imply that the gods of Eld have something to do with the kidnapping of other races from their planets? 
Does the Dragon Accord and Rock Nilthamo's adherence to it give him some bargaining chip with the gods of Elm? We know next to nothing about the co-authors of the Accord, the native divines of Evozul, as it was called then. What could they benefit from its writing? Perhaps, speculation, it was insurance that they would never be usurped by the ancient dragons or the other gods. In this veritable sea of questions, one of the most important that we should ask is how this magical accord affects us in the world of Terminus. It's a bit hard to know all the juicy details since we can't get in-game yet, but there are some definite conclusions we can draw. First and foremost, the Dragon Accord prevents the gods of the various races from interacting with them. Obvious, right? The effects of this are kind of far-reaching, though. From a playability perspective, this is important to force the different races to be less insular and secluded. This also probably greatly impacts any religious or a deity-based classes, of which we have at least two, Cleric and Paladin. We're told that clerics can, quote, hardly rely on their pantheon directly. Instead, they must bind themselves to the ancient directives of their order, guided by the written wisdom of the Celestials of ages past, end quote. Does this imply that Terminus clerics attempt to give homage to the Elder Gods? Or would they continue to worship the gods they knew on their home planet? We have little information on paladins, but it would be fair to ask these same questions of them. Another great impact that the Dragon Accord has upon Terminus is making the world as a whole much less theological. How could one be religious if they have no deities? At the time of launch, there is likely no one from any of the nine races that was alive during their collision. There are likely no living mortals who have had experiences with any deity barring Kazus. We see this exemplified with the elves. When Visionary Realms first released their class and race matrix, many were confused or dismayed that elves could be neither clerics nor paladins. But with the March newsletter, we were given a bit of information about this. And, like one may have been able to infer, it has a lot to do with the celestial boundary. Over time, the elves being one of the first to arrive on Terminus, they adapted to their new world. They no longer depend, or perhaps even believe in, their pantheon, and have become a much more philosophical than religious group. This is almost certainly true of other groups as well, such as the Scar, whose Nine God was largely antagonistic to them. They were likely relieved to not be beholden to such a deity upon Terminus. The humans in Archai were both betrayed by a deity, and none other have been named thus far, so their religious stance could be very tumultuous or even rebellious. So as you can see, the Dragon Accord isn't simply some mythic law written by faraway characters that we'll never see, that will never affect us. This agreement will impact every character, every life upon Terminus, from their religious beliefs to their hope of ever uncovering the mysteries of the planet. Thanks for listening in to our talk about the Dragon Accord, and see you guys next time.